from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! A long time ago, I wanted, I wanted to find me a good wife. I wanted to raise a family. I wanted to have my own business and everything. I never, I never got the chance to uh, fulfill those dreams. Never got the chance because the people took 30 years away from me and they, and they destroyed my life. Two African-American half-brothers have been exonerated of rape and murder after 30 years behind bars in North Carolina. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia once pointed to their case as an example of why the death penalty is just. Today, they are free men. We'll speak with an attorney for one of the exonerees, as well as the former legal director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Then, New York Democratic Governor Andrew Cuomo is being challenged in his own party's primary. We'll speak to Fordham Law Professor Zephyr Teachout and political activist Randy Credico, who are both running against Cuomo, as well as Lieutenant Governor candidate Tim Wu. He coined the concept of net neutrality. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Violence continues in eastern Ukraine between government forces and Russian-backed separatists, following a day of confusion over a ceasefire. Ukraine initially claimed it had reached a ceasefire with Russia, only to retract the claim after Russian President Vladimir Putin said his government is not a party to the conflict. <clears throat> Putin then unveiled his own seven-point peace plan, which Ukraine in turn dismissed as a ruse. Speaking during a visit to Estonia, President Obama squarely blamed Russia for the fighting and vowed to defend Baltic states he suggested are threatened by Moscow. It's going to take time for us to be able to roll them back, and it is going to take time for us to be able to form the regional coalition that's going to be required so that we can reach out to Sunni tribes in some of the areas that ISIS has occupied and make sure that we have allies on the ground in combination with the airstrikes that we've already conducted. So the bottom line is this. Uh, our objective is clear, and that is to degrade and destroy ISIL so that it's no longer a threat, not just to Iraq, but also the region and to the United States. President Obama was speaking ahead of today's NATO summit in Wales, where member states are expected to approve new sanctions against Russia and the creation of a 4,000-strong force for rapid deployment in Eastern Europe. France, meanwhile, has announced the suspension of a warship delivery to the Russian military. At the NATO summit beginning today, President Obama and other foreign leaders are expected to discuss an international coalition against the militant group Islamic State. Speaking during his visit to Estonia, Obama said the U.S. objective is to degrade and destroy ISIL. President Obama's comments were echoed more forcefully by Vice President Joe Biden, who told a crowd in New Hampshire the U.S. will follow ISIL to the gates of hell. As a nation, we're united. And when people harm Americans, we don't retreat. We don't forget. We take care of those who are grieving. And when that's finished, they should know we will follow them to the gates of hell until they are brought to justice. Because hell is where they will reside. Hell is where they will reside. The death toll from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa has topped 1,900, including around 400 people over the past week. There are around 3,500 confirmed cases in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Nigeria and Senegal. Margaret Chan of the World Health Organization said the scale of the outbreak is unprecedented. This Ebola epidemic is the largest and most severe and most complex we have ever seen in the nearly 40-year history of this disease. No one, even uh, outbreak responders, uh, would experience, dating back to 1976 to 1995, people that were directly involved with those outbreaks, none of them have ever seen anything like it. 
The Justice Department is launching a civil rights probe of the police department in Ferguson, Missouri, where the unarmed African-American teenager Michael Brown was killed last month. The investigation, separate from another civil rights investigation, specifically into Brown's killing at the hands of Ferguson officer Darren Wilson. The announcement follows weeks of protests sparked by Brown's death that brought to light allegations of racial profiling and other police abuses against African American residents. The probe could expand to other areas surrounding Ferguson. The Detroit area resident convicted in the killing of unarmed African American 19 year old Renisha McBride has been sentenced to a minimum of 17 years in prison. Theodore Wafer was found guilty of second degree murder and manslaughter for shooting McBride on the porch of his home last November. McBride was apparently seeking help after a car crash when he shot her in the face through a screen door. He claimed he'd feared for his life. The killing sparked mass protests as prosecutors took about two weeks to file charges. At his sentencing on Wednesday, Wafer apologized to McBride's family, saying he'll carry, quote, guilt and sorrow forever. A federal program that sees local police forces hand over immigrant detainees for potential deportation has been found to have no effect on lowering crime rates. Under secure communities, local police share prisoners' fingerprints with the Department of Homeland Security, which can then order immigration holds that result in deportation. But a new study from two law professors shows the program has had no meaningful reduction in the overall crime rate of communities involved. The authors say their study, quote, calls into question the long-standing assumption that deporting non-citizens who commit crimes is an effective crime control strategy. A top Palestinian lawmaker says Palestinians will ask the United Nations Security Council to impose a three-year deadline for Israel to end the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Speaking at the United Nations, Hanan Ashrawi said the Palestinian Authority will push for an end to the occupation, as well as for international criminal court jurisdiction. Ashrawi dismissed the threat of losing U.S. government support. We will be seeking a Security Council resolution uh, on ending the occupation within that specified date. And any solution must be based on international law, cannot violate international law and UN conventions and agreements. If the U.S. wants to isolate itself as a reaction to Palestinians joining the international community, then that, uh, they're welcome to do that. Uh, uh, the American funding is not uh, that essential to, to Palestinian survival. Quite often, joining the international community, having the protection of the law and so on, is much more important than uh, getting some funding from Congress that is conditional. Hanan Ashrawi went on to say, quote, enough is enough, and what has the U.S. done for us? Her comments appear to mark the most forceful public repudiation to date of the Obama administration's policy by a Palestinian leader tied to President Mahmoud Abbas. A new poll this week shows Hamas has surged in Palestinian public opinion since the Israeli assault on Gaza. According to the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research, Hamas would defeat Abbas's Fatah party by a wide margin if national elections were held today. Hanan Ashrawi's comments come days after Israel proved its largest seizure of Palestinian land in three decades, nearly a 1,000 acres in the occupied West Bank. At a news briefing, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power, criticized Israel's decision. The U.S. position on settlement activity is very well known. Uh, we have long made clear our opposition to settlement activity. Um, we're deeply concerned by the reports uh, of expanded settlement activity over the last few days, uh, and we call on the government of Israel to reverse uh, its decision. I think that these actions uh, are contrary to Israel's stated goal uh, of achieving uh, a permanent status agreement with uh, the Palestinians. Despite saying it opposes Israeli settlements, the Obama administration has previously vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution declaring them illegal. 
A Columbia University senior, who says she was raped on campus two years ago, has launched a novel protest and performance art piece to call for the expulsion of her alleged perpetrator. For her senior thesis project, Emma Solkowitz will carry around a twin-size dorm room mattress with her everywhere she goes on campus until her rapist is expelled. She calls her piece, Carry That Weight. I will be carrying this dorm room matches with me everywhere I go for as long as I attend the same school as my rapist. Um, and the piece could potentially take a day, or it could go on until I graduate. That clip is from the Columbia Spectator. Solkowitz says the perpetrator has also sexually assaulted two other female students. She was part of a federal complaint challenging Columbia University's handling of rape cases earlier this year. And fast food workers across the country are holding their latest mass strike today to call for higher wages and improve workplace conditions. Strikes and sit-ins are taking place at fast food chains in and around 150 cities to demand a $15 minimum wage, the right to organize, and an end to wage theft. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show with the case of two African-American half-brothers who have been exonerated of rape and murder convictions in North Carolina after over 30 years behind bars. Henry Lee McCollum and Leon Brown were found guilty in 1984 of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl. There was no physical evidence tying them to the crime, but police obtained confessions that McCollum and Brown have always said were coerced. In fact, during his trial, McCollum recanted his confession 226 times. Police at the time <clears throat> failed to investigate another man, Roscoe Artis, who lived near the crime scene and had admitted to a similar rape and murder at around the same time. After 30 years, the case saw a major breakthrough last month, when testing by North Carolina's Innocence Inquiry Commission tied Artis's DNA to the crime scene. After a hearing presenting the new evidence Tuesday, the two brothers were declared innocent and ordered freed. This is McCollum speaking Wednesday, after he was released from death row. I'm happy. I'm very um, emotional. I want to, you know, thank God. For the glory, praise all go to him. And um, I've been through I've been through a long journey in Central Prison. I came here in '84, uh, me and my brother Leon Brown, and um, it was a rough it was a rough experience. Sometimes I felt like giving up and stuff, but I said no, I can't do that. The life move on. I knew one day. That I was going to be blessed to get out of prison. I just didn't know when that time was going to be. Almighty God, that kept me going strong. A lot of joy and rejoicing, happiness and everything. Because I, I was very anxious when they told me this news and stuff. I wanted to get away from this place. And last night, I only had like a couple hours of sleep and stuff. And, um, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm just, I just thank God. I just thank God that I'm out of this place. Both Henry McCollum and his brother Leon Brown have mental disabilities. McCollum's IQ is between 60 and 69, and Brown has scored as low as 49. Both were originally sentenced to death. After a second trial, Brown was convicted of rape and sentenced to life in prison, while McCollum remained on death row. In a recent interview with the News and Observer, after the DNA testing pointed to a likely exoneration, he said he never lost hope that he would one day see freedom. Since I've been here, I have never stopped believing that one day I would be able to walk, walk out that door. I never stopped believing that. Because long, long time, long time ago, I wanted, I wanted to find me a good wife. I wanted to raise a family. I wanted to have my own business and everything. I never, I never got the chance to uh, fulfill those dreams. Never got the chance because the people took 30 years away from me and they, and they destroyed my life. 
Now, I, I believe, I believe that God is going to bless me to get back out there. Over the years, death penalty supporters have cited the brothers' case in order to back capital punishment. In 2010, the North Carolina Republican Party pasted McCollum's mugshot on campaign mailers. In 1994, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia pointed to McCollum as an example of why the death penalty is just. For more, we go to Raleigh, North Carolina, where we're joined by Vernetta Alston. She is one of the lawyers representing Henry McCullum and a staff attorney with the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you describe the scene yesterday, uh, Vernetta Alston, when uh, Henry McCullum and Leon Brown were freed? Well, I was I was there for uh, Henry's release. I unfortunately wasn't able to go to Mari to see Leon's, but for Henry's at Central Prison. Um, it was exciting. And he was happy. He was clearly relieved. His dad and stepmother were, I think, nervous and very excited for their son to come home. Um, and Henry, you know, had a handful of other supporters, including myself and another member of his legal team. And it was, it was, it was a relief. And, Vernetta Alston, uh, could you talk a little bit about the uh, origins of the case when they were originally uh, uh, arrested uh, and the issue of the confessions and how confessions were gotten from them? Sure. So, in September of 1983, both Henry, who was 19, and Leon, who was 15, and as you mentioned, they're both intellectually disabled, um, were taken to the police, or Henry was taken to the police station by law enforcement officials and questioned for between four and five hours. And Leon came to the station, <clears throat> excuse me, um, shortly after Henry, just to, just to check, just to see what was happening. And once he got there, he was brought into a room by two other law enforcement officials, and both boys were questioned into the early hours of the, of the morning. And they were, they were manipulated. <clears throat> and threatened and told that if they just signed these statements, that they could go home. And so, you know, around 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, both boys signed these statements that were uh, filled with details th that were only known to law enforcement officials at the time, and they thought that they could go home. And, you know, they quickly learned that that wasn't the case, and they were arrested. Can you talk about um, their <clears throat> protests of innocence in prison, particularly Henry McCollum, your sure, client? So I, I represent Henry. Henry has maintained his innocence since the day he was first detained at the, the Red Springs Police Department, and he has been steadfast in that claim ever since. In every meeting that I've had with Henry over the past two and a half years, um, the only thing that he wants to, wanted to talk about was his innocence. And to prison officials, he's maintained the same refrain, that he was completely innocent of this crime, and, and, and his brother Leon was as well. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about the 1994 debate where Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia pointed to Henry McCollum as an example of why the death penalty is just. Uh, he wrote, quote, for example, the case of an 11-year-old girl raped by four men and then killed by stuffing her panties down her throat. How enviable a quiet death by lethal injection compared with that. Of lethal injection compared with that. Scalia has long been a vocal supporter of capital punishment and has suggested that an innocent man has never been put to death, at least in recent years. Uh, Vanetta, uh, uh, Alston, what would you say to Justice Scalia now? And, and he was having a debate with Justice Blackman at the time. He made that statement. He was wrong. And this case and cases like it prove that he's been wrong ever since, and he's wrong now. Um, innocent people are on death row. Innocent people likely have been put to death, and that should be a huge problem. And I think it's, it illustrates how um, irredeemable the death penalty is as a punishment. Uh, in his interview with the News and Observer, Henry McCollum said he made up the story about attacking the girl Sabrina Bowie so he could just go home after he'd been interrogated for several hours. In this clip, he describes the detective's behavior during questioning and his response. 
I was like sitting in a chair and he got all up in my face hollering at me. That kind of, that kind of shook me. It scared me up a little bit. And uh, cause I had never, I had never been in no police station before being questioned by police. And then he, he to my, you know you killed that girl. You know you killed that girl. I said, man, I ain't killed nobody, man. I ain't seen that girl that night. And uh, he said, when I come back in this, come back in here, you better tell me the truth and all that, right? I said, I told you the truth, where I was that night. He said, no, you told me you was at home. I said, that was where I was, at home. I wasn't out on 12.30 at night. I say he came back in like five minutes later. I had made up my mind, right? Because I had never been under this much pressure of a person hollering at me and threatening me and all that crazy stuff. So what I did, I gave him uh, false names and made up a story. This is the way the crime happened when, when the crime didn't really happen that way and all that, right? Because I was trying to go home. I gave him a false confession. That was uh, Henry McCollum in prison in that interview. Vernetta Austin, if you could uh, respond to what he said. Uh, Henry McCollum had two trials. Uh, he did. He did. And uh, we we know now that this, that he was threatened, that, you know, because of his disabilities, because he was poor and, and wasn't in a position intellectually to defend himself, that he was manipulated in, in, that, in that confession and, and forced to uh, tell a story, again, so that what he, he thought he could go home. That's what they told him. They said if he if he if he gave them that information that he could leave. Um. Uh, Vernetta Alston, I want to ask you not only about the uh, you've talked about the police misconduct in this case in terms of the uh, mm -hmm. confessions, but what about the prosecution withholding evidence that could have been used to exonerate the men? Could you talk about that as well? Absolutely. So, one of the biggest pieces and one of the most alarming things that we've learned. Uh, in the last few months, through the Innocence Inquiry Commission's work, is that law enforcement had requested that a fingerprint, a known fingerprint, found at the crime scene next to sticks with the victim's blood on it, um, a request had been made for that fingerprint to be compared to Roscoe Artis, um, whose DNA was found at the scene and who committed uh, a, a very similar rape three weeks later. Um, rape and that murder, request right. Of rape and murder, correct. So that request was was made three days before Henry's trial and was never carried out. And based on what we know now, that request was never divulged to Henry's trial attorneys uh, by the state. And that represents a, a, a huge violation of Henry and Leon's constitutional rights. And these cases, in 1984, uh, were prosecuted by Joe Freeman Britt, um, who was a notorious, um, notorious supporter of the death penalty and who secured between 40 and 50 death sentences during his tenure as district, district attorney. Um, and so I think what we've seen as a pattern in, in those cases is that he was incredibly reckless to the point where all but two of his convictions and his death sentences have been overturned. Um, and the only two that haven't are folks who have been executed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that should signal a huge problem with all of his cases in terms of what he's turned over, what he hasn't in his own rush to judgment, in his own priorities in getting a conviction rather than seeking the truth. We're going to continue this discussion after break. Vernetta Alston, stay with us. One of the lawyers for Henry McCullum and a staff attorney for the Center for Death Penalty Litigation, when we come back, will also be joined by Steve Drizzen, who is the legal director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Stay with us. Have you seen the iron lady's charms, legs of steel, leather on her arms, taken on a man to die, life for a life, and I for an eye, and that's the iron lady in the chair. Stop the murder. Deter the crimes away. Only killing shows killing doesn't pay. Yes, that's the kind of law it takes, even though we make mistakes. And so 
sometimes send the wrong man to the chair in the death row waiting for their turn no time to change not a chance to learn waiting for someone to call say it's over after all they won't have to face the justice of the chair the Iron Lady by Phil Oaks, here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we continue to look at the case of Henry Lee McCollum and Leon Brown, two African-American half-brothers who have been exonerated of rape and murder convictions in North Carolina after over 30 years behind bars. To talk more about the case and the broader issue of false confessions, we're joined by Steve Drizzen. He's clinical professor at Northwestern Law School, also the assistant dean of the Bloom Legal Clinic, where, for more than a decade, he's legal director of their Center on Wrongful Convictions. Still with us, Vernetta Alston one of the lawyers for Henry McCullum and a staff attorney with the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. She is with us in North Carolina. He is with us in Chicago. Stephen Drizzen, how did this case happen? Talk about uh, the case of Brown and McCullum. Um, and after 30 years, um, it was discovered uh, that uh, the DNA actually belonged to another man. Well, the case happened, as in many cases of false confessions, it begins with a brutal, horrific crime, often the murder and rape of a, of a small child. And police officers are desperate to solve that case, and they zero in on suspects who are innocent, but for whatever reason believe they are guilty. In this case, the only reason they suspected Henry McCollum is because a a local 17-year-old girl had said she didn't like the way that he stared at, at women in the community. Um, so once they focused on McCollum, they brought him in and they grilled him relentlessly for hours. And they threatened him with the death penalty and they promised him that he would go home. And they prepared a detailed written statement for him to sign. And at that point in time, as he says, I would have pretty much signed anything in order to go home. The fact that this confession was unreliable was apparent on the very face of this confession. As his attorney remarked, there were a ton of details in the confession that only law enforcement officers had known. They obviously put those in the confession. But when they asked him a question about who he participated with in the crime, he named two other young men who were never even charged in the case, because they had rock-solid alibis. So once this confession entered the case and entered the stream of evidence, it's the most powerful piece of evidence in a court of law. And their conviction and sentence of death was pretty much assured. And, Steve Drizzen, the issue of how often these confessions become the basis of capital punishment cases, could you talk about that? Well, we know that among the cases that have led to exonerations of people by DNA evidence, that approximately 20 to 25 percent of those 300 and approximately 320 exonerations involve false confessions. We also have evidence of hundreds of other false confession cases, and almost all of them, more than 80 percent of them, are in murder cases, which in most states qualify for capital punishment. Renetta Alston, the whole issue of the North Carolina um, in Innocence Inquiry Commission, what is that? And how were they the ones, ultimately, to exonerate uh, the two half-brothers? Sure. The North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission is an independent state agency um, that, was, that was created around 2007, 2008. Um, and so they function independent of they're not related to any prosecutorial agencies or any defense organizations. They're an independent agency that looks into uh, claims of innocence to find, you know, evidence that hasn't been uncovered and to verify um, claims of innocence. Um, they got involved uh, 
in 2010, following a letter from Leon Brown uh, in 2009 asking them to look into his case. So from 2010 up until basically Tuesday, um, they've had an, an active investigation going on um, in Leon Brown's case, um, with the understanding that the evidence, you know, related to Leon's case is identical to that for Henry McCollum. Um, so that's how they got involved, and they've conducted, they've done an exhaustive investigation and have tested and retested um, many of the items of physical evidence that were found. They've conducted interviews. They've done a phenomenal job in this case. And, Steve Drizzen, the importance of this commission in North Carolina, and I understand it's one of the only ones uh, like it uh, in the country, uh, and the, uh, the impact that this could have in other states around the country? This You can't overstate um, the importance of this commission. Uh, these two men would have probably died in prison if it wasn't for their exhaustive investigation. And there is no other state with such a commission. The, the beauty of the commission is that it has subpoena power. It can obtain documents that oftentimes are not produced by the state to defense attorneys. That, in fact, happened in this case. It can expedite DNA testing and can send it to a private lab and make sure that the results qualify for being uploaded into a national database. It did a wide-ranging and exhaustive investigation, and it was completely independent of any of the parties in the case. So when they took a fresh look at this case, they were not looking at it with blinders on. There was no chance of tunnel vision. They were just seeking the truth. And what prompted North Carolina to establish the commission? A number of wrongful convictions, uh, including several in death penalty cases, led the then Supreme Court Chief Justice, I. Beverly Lake, to convene a commission on actual innocence. And that commission looked at all of the causes of wrongful convictions in North Carolina and passed and suggested a number of reforms to prevent wrongful convictions. And one of the reforms it suggested was to have an independent body outside of the court system to be able to evaluate claims of innocence. Uh, Professor Drizzen, um, Henry McCollum's own lawyers um, pressured him to plead guilty in the second trial. Can you talk about this? Uh, it just shows to me a couple things. One is, is the way in which the death penalty can corrupt the search for truth. Um, clearly, police officers coerced and threatened these suspects with a death penalty at the beginning. The prosecutor wore his death penalty convictions, con convictions like notches on his belt in this case. And even the death penalty lawyers, two of the best death penalty lawyers I know of, um, they felt compelled to pressure Henry to confess to an expert because they figured that they were going to, that Henry was going to get convicted after his um, case had been reversed and that they needed him to confess in order to save his life. Um, so the, the, the mere presence of the death penalty corrupted the search for truth at every single process of this case. And you have to understand one thing. The, I salute the lawyers in this case, the defense lawyers. They did a miraculous job to keep these two men alive for 31 years. But the reality was, is back in 1983 and even in 1988, when these men were tried, we didn't know very much about false Lost it. Uh, we seem to have just lost the audio for uh, Professor Steve Drizzen. He is a clinical professor at Northwestern Law School, assistant dean of the Bloom Legal Clinic, where for more than a decade he was legal director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Well, I'd like to ask uh, Vernetta Alston, your uh, your client Henry McCollum was uh, 
for 30, more than 30 years in prison. During that time, uh, about, what, more than 40 other death row inmates that he was sharing uh, cells with or, or was incarcerated with ended up being executed. Could you talk about uh, the emotional uh, damage done to him during all these years? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Henry witnessed or saw 42 lived through 42 executions while he was on death row. Um, he saw many of his friends, uh, many of the people he spent most of the days with, um, executed. And it took a tremendous toll on him. Um, it got to the point where, when an execution was scheduled and was set to be carried out, he would get so anxious and so depressed that the staff would have to isolate him. They'd have to put him basically in a cage by himself just so they could watch him, because he would become so distraught um, and so emotional at seeing one of his friends taken to an execution chamber. Um, and that pattern persisted um, over the many years that he had to see um, his fellow inmates um, executed. Um, and so it, 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 it has resulted in, you know, I think years of depression and anxiety that he still struggles with. Um, Stephen Drizzen, we're talking to you from uh, perhaps the uh, death penalty uh, capital of the United States, from Chicago. Uh, can you talk about or false the issue of false convictions? Can you talk about what is happening in Illinois? Well, we're not the death penalty capital of the United States. We abolished the death penalty. <laughs> I meant to say um, false convictions. <laughs> yeah. We are the false confession capital of the United States. And part of the reason we abolished the death penalty is because over the past decade or so, we've had literally dozens of cases of young African American men who were pressured into falsely confessing to murders and rapes that they did not commit, very much like the McCollum case. And as those cases began to mount, pressure to first put a moratorium in place and then to abolish the death penalty um, uh, happened in here in Illinois. And, and uh, I hope that the McCollum case, which is one of those um, mad as hell and I just can't take it anymore kind of cases, leads North Carolina to finally abolish the death penalty there. Stephen Drizzen, I want to thank you for being with us, clinical professor at Northwestern Law School, assistant dean of the Bloom Legal Clinic, uh, for more than a decade, the legal director of their Center on Wrongful Convictions. And thank you so much to Vernetta Alston, one of the lawyers for Henry McCullum, a staff attorney with the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, uh, we'll have a discussion um, with the um, candidates in the Democratic primary for governor and lieutenant governor here in New York State. Stay with us. A good man is hard to find, Tom Waits. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.
We turn now to politics here in New York State, where Andrew Cuomo, one of the nation's most well-known Democratic governors, is facing a challenge from within his own party as he seeks re-election. Voters head to the polls next Tuesday for the state's Democratic primary. Cuomo's quest for re-election has taken some unexpected turns as he faces two primary challenges. Fordham Law professor Zephyr Teachout and comedian and activist Randy Critical. Last week, The New York Times declined to endorse any of the candidates in the primary. The paper criticized Cuomo in part because of his decision to disband a commission he had created to root out corruption in state politics. The paper praised Teachout's push to fight corruption and reform the state's campaign finance system. Meanwhile, the Times editorial page did endorse Teachout's running mate, Tim Wu, for lieutenant governor over former U.S. Congresswoman Kathy Hochul, who is running uh, with Cuomo. Wu is a Columbia law professor best known for coming up with the open Internet principle of net neutrality. If he were to win, Wu would become the first Asian American elected to a statewide office in New York State. While most of the Democratic establishment has backed the Cuomo ticket, the Teach Out Wu campaign has received some notable endorsements, including the Public Employees Federation, the state's second largest union of government workers, as well as the state chapters of the National Organization of Women and the Sierra Club. Randy Credico, who's previously run for New York City mayor and the U.S. Senate, is running on a platform calling for economic economic justice and the reform of the state's drug laws. So far, Governor Cuomo and former Congress member Hockel have declined all invitations to debate their challengers. We invited them to join us today, but they declined. Uh, but we are joined by the other Democrats on Tuesday's ballot, Zephyr Teachout and her running mate, Tim Wu, as well as Randy Credico. And we welcome you all to Democracy Now! Zephyr Teachout, why are you running? Why do you feel there needs to be a change in New York? Uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, despite calling himself a Democrat, has governed as a Republican. His whole policy and everything he's pushed has been tax breaks, tax giveaways for the wealthy, and it's really hurting New York State. New York is now the most unequal state of all the states, with the most segregated schools. So I am running uh, for the old-fashioned reason that I, I know I would be a better governor. Um, that my values align with the values of New Yorkers, and I'd actually fight for all New Yorkers. Uh, you, you just came from the fast food workers protest yes. earlier this morning? Yes. No. Um, I joined, and I'm happy to stand with the fast food workers who are protesting for a fair wage and a union. Uh, in New York City, you need $15 an hour just, just to make a living. Um, and I, I talked to some of the people um, who were there protesting, asking where they found their courage. I talked to a woman who'd walked off uh, the job seven times in a, a striking KFC. And she said, well, um, it's my family. And when she said her family, what she meant is the other people that she works with and the other people who are in the same situation. And she said, I, for myself, I could do it maybe once, but for my family and all of us, I find the courage. Well, you were originally recruited by the Working Families Party as a potential gubernatorial candidate, and then the very party, the independent party, the more uh, left-wing party in, in uh, New York politics. And then, at their own convention, they essentially cut a deal with the governor. Among the things that he promised to do would be to support a state uh, a raise in the state minimum yeah. wage. Could you talk about that whole situation and, and your decision to go ahead and run anyway? Yeah, sure. I was recruited in, uh, around March 15th. And when they recruited me, I explained that I'm also a Democrat and also wanted to run in the Democratic primary. Um, so when uh, Andrew Cuomo heard about my candidacy in the Working Families Party primary, he did something that is remarkable for a Democrat only because it's Andrew Cuomo, which is he finally agreed to support a Democratic Senate. I think people really need to understand how much he is not a Democrat. Mm -hmm. He, he really has worked behind the scenes to have a Republican Senate. We have a really Democratic state here. Um, but I decided to continue to run um, because, despite Andrew Cuomo's promises, um, he didn't say anything about fracking. He's, he has made no commitment to ban fracking. He's made no commitment to fully fund our schools, and our schools are in a crisis. And he made no commitment. Um, to actually turn our tax system right side up. Right now, it's, it's uh, the wealthiest New Yorkers 
pay less as a percentage of their income than the middle 20 percent. Oh, Randy Critical, I want to ask you, you have a long history with Andrew Cuomo. Years back, you joined with him in the fight uh, uh, to uh, uh, do away with the Rockefeller drug laws, and now you've decided not only to challenge him, but also to to uh, to vie for the nomination with Zephyr Teacher. Talk about what your decision to enter the race. Well, I was in the race uh, long before Zephyr was in. I uh, got into it in January because Andrew Cuomo is a reactionary Democrat, but the Democratic Party is, react is a reactionary party. Uh, he's a Lieberman uh, Democrat, uh, Cuomo. Uh, Zephyr is an Obama-Clinton kind of Democrat. I am a uh, Amy Goodman Democrat or Bill Kunstler Democrat or Jeremy Scahill Democrat. I represent the far left of the Democratic Party. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, I did work with him back in 2003 against the Rockefeller drug laws. In fact, he wrote a column about it. Back then, he called for a complete elimination of the laws, and we got some change. However, now that he's been in office as governor, he hasn't mentioned it. He hasn't granted one clemency, not one clemency since he's been in. That's what really prompted me to run against him. I mean, Southern governors like Orville Farbus and, and George Wallace and Lester Maddox and all the rest all gave clemency. He hasn't given one clemency or pardon the four years that he's been there, even though he had all these cracks in the changes of the Rockefeller drug laws. And there are a number of other reasons. We need to reform the criminal justice system. I mean, not just reform it, really start all over again. I was recently arrested uh, here for filming the police and spent 24 hours in Bronx Central booking just for filming the police. I want to tell you something. I've been in prison and jail in Nicaragua. I've been in jail in Honduras. I've never seen conditions like the conditions that we have in that particular jail that I was in. But it's all over the state. We have 55,000 people in prison in this state. Compare how New York, Randy, um, compares to the rest of the country when it comes to drug laws. Uh, well, it's still very bad. You can still get 12 years in prison for for the attempted sale of a $5 bag of cocaine, for attempted sale or for steering. Uh, you know, you talk of this great episode that you had uh, prior to this on the death penalty in, in North Carolina. You can actually get off. Uh, with DNA, uh, if you're convicted of rape or of murder, you can't on drug charges. There are thousands of people who are framed who will will say, "Okay, I, I'm guilty," because they don't want to spend a year in Rikers awaiting trial. Thousands, but you can't get off on DNA. You just can't get off. So, and that's across the country. There are thousands and thousands of people in jail who shouldn't be there. Uh, we have 55,000. When Attica went up in smoke in, two, in 1971, which anniversary is coming up, uh, you know we. We had 10,000 people in jail. Now we have 55,000 people in jail, almost exclusively people of color. That's why I'm really running, is to represent them. If I could get all their families to vote for me, I would win next Tuesday. Mm. Uh, Tim Wu, I wanted to ask you, you uh, you've gotten some surprise endorsements <laughs> uh, from not only the New York Times, uh, the New York Observer, and, and your ticket has been endorsed not only by the Public Employees Federation, but also, I think, the Buffalo Teachers Union as well. Could you talk about sure. uh, what you would hope to do for the governor, which is essentially a job that no one really knew about right, until right. Elliot Spitzer uh, was forced to resign and David Patterson, the lieutenant governor, took over as governor. Yeah, well, I'm running uh, generally because I feel there's a, a battle going on for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party right now. It's beginning right now between people who are more serious about the problem of inequality in our country, people who are less serious about that problem. Lieutenant governor position in New York, I think, has been a position of wasted potential. It's a constitutional position. And I think it could be used as a position of public advocacy, where I would serve as an independent voice in state government and a critic of, of some of the things that go on. We have a problem with checks and balances in state government, uh, and we need to have it addressed. And one of the ways is to reinvent the role of lieutenant governor, and that's why I've been uh, running. The New York Times, The Observer, other uh, groups have endorsed my vision, and I'm very proud of that. Well, you are known as an Internet activist. Uh, you really, um, uh, really originated the whole concept of net neutrality. Mm -hmm. On September 10th, there's going to be what's known as what an Internet slowdown. Activists are organizing um, around the country and the world. Um, you might go to their website, and the spinning wheel of death <laughs> will be there, right. showing what it would be like if the it, basically if net neutrality is uh, is done away with explain mm -hmm. what it is and why your issue uh, around net neutrality w weighs into your desire to be lieutenant governor yeah, of New sure. York you know the reason a million people took the time to write in comments to the federal government about net neutrality is because they believe that equality in our times is threatened and they see the internet the open internet which has long been the bastion of equal speech 
where you know an obscure blogger has a similar voice to a, to a wealthy uh, newspaper, and they say, we want the Internet open, we believe in a society that is more equal. And in some ways, I think the passion for net neutrality right now is really reflective of a deeper concern with widening inequality in this country. The Internet slowdown is designed to dramatize what it would be like to live uh, on uh, or to have an Internet where the rich get faster speeds, the slow get slower. It's like divided sidewalks or something. It feels so wrong that people are getting fired up about it. You're it also challenging the Comcast Time Warner merger? I am. Uh, the, I, I think the states should take an act, I actually, federal government and the state should take an active role in blocking a merger, which is very bad for Americans, very bad uh, uh, for the entire country. Cable rates, the, the prices we pay for cable, are unregulated, generally, and have gone so high, they're threatening the day-to-day -day life of, of lower-income and middle-income people. They've become this enormous thing. They're rising many, many times the price of inflation, and they're just in a position to extort payments. We need to stop this merger and start asking, why are we letting these monopolies just charge us these outrageous prices and threaten the Internet, open Internet? And, you know, it's a serious problem, and I, I think it should be stopped. Ms. Zephyr, I'd like to ask you about the whole issue of public corruption. When uh, when Andrew Cuomo ran uh, for governor the first time, he said he was going to clean up Albany. He established a commission, the Moreland Commission, that was supposed to look into corruption. Uh, and um, then he disbanded the commission, and now there's a federal investigation of whether his office or people around him had some kind of a role uh, in trying to thwart some of the investigations of the Moreland Commission. Could you talk about the importance of this particular uh, issue of uh, uh, Cuomo's track record on this? His track record is terrible. And it's, a, it's he broke his core promise. His core campaign promise was to clean up Albany to push for publicly funded elections, which we all know we need to do, because we, if we don't get at the root issue of who is funding campaigns, we, it's hard to get at all the other issues. Um, he promised to uh, push for a Republican, uh, for a, a Democratic Senate by vetoing incumbent protection gerrymandered districts. He promised to get rid of a uh, loophole that allows corporations in New York can give directly to candidates. And instead of all of that, we have this real scandal in New York. Uh, because he created an anti-corruption commission saying it can search anywhere, go anywhere. And the minute it started getting close to his friends, his business associates, he shut it down. And now there's new news uh, evidence that his top aide was saying what subpoenas they should be issuing and what subpoenas they weren't. This is a very serious violation of public trust. And the reason it matters is because the big money real estate and the big banks and the business associates of Andrew Cuomo are getting special favors. They are getting the tax giveaways. And meanwhile, New Yorkers are really suffering. Uh, you know, the wage gap is growing. Um, so many people are food insecure. This is New York State, which has a deep commitment to being egalitarian, to being open to public education. So the reason I care about corruption is because of how it affects people's lives. I mean, this is an old boy network in Albany. How does what's happening in the issue of corruption in New York compare to the country? You have a book coming out called Corruption in America, from Benjamin Franklin's snuff box to Citizens United. Well, I think it's a terrible example of what's happening. I mean, certainly it's gotten worse since 2010 um, nationally because of Citizens United. But there's a deep cynicism that we have to overcome. And I think people are actually seeing that you still have the power of the vote. You can still kick out people like Andrew Cuomo. Um, but the outside money has a very insidious effect. And it's why it's so urgent to change the way uh, we fund elections. And, and Randy, the, the, uh, I would think that on many of these issues, you and Zephyr Teachout would agree, but you're, still, but you're running against her as well as against Cuomo. Could you talk about the differences that you yeah, see between you? A lot of differences uh, that we have. Like I said, she's a mainstream Democrat. I, when this is over, if I lose on Tuesday, I'm supporting Howie Hawkins and the Green Party. She hasn't ruled out uh, supporting uh, Andrew Cuomo in spite of his corruption, uh, which I don't think is such a big thing, by the way. I think the biggest problem in this state we should focus on is the economy. This, all of this stuff, and I think it's a Chuck Schumer hit job on Andrew Cuomo. That's his guy there, the U.S. attorney, the same guy who put Jeremy Hammond and Lynn Stewart in jail. It's a guy that she's rooting for. I'm not rooting for that guy. So what I'm rooting for is that we, we change this economy. My 
uh, economic advisor, Richard Wolf, has laid out a blueprint that I'm following, which is to tax Wall Street to 1 percent uh, Tobin sales tax, a progressive real estate tax, cutting out 421A, which gives uh, big breaks to uh, all the sports uh, teams in the city if they give, uh, provide some affordable housing, and they never do, and uh, to, to tax uh, stocks and bonds, uh, intangible assets, and, uh, along with uh, tangible assets like cars and, uh, and homes. So we have. There are a lot of differences here. Uh, we won't, she won't talk about Israel. I will. Con, I have condemned Israel for their uh, occupation of Gaza. Andrew Cuomo went to Israel, visited the caves, but didn't invi visit the graves in Gaza. I will say it. I mean, it's it's sudden death to talk about Israel. It really is in New York politics. But I stand on principle on that. She hasn't spoken out, and you have to talk about your position on the occupation of Gaza. Zephyr, teach out your, your position on this issue. Um, you know, I actually think we agree on a lot of different issues, but I've been, I've stayed neutral as, as governor. I will be representing all of New York, and I've certainly talked to people um, and feel great compassion for what's happening on both sides of the conflict, and I will be a governor of uh, Jews and Muslims in New York. Um, but I'm not running for president, and I'm not going to be uh, making foreign policy um, uh, decisions. No. Uh, t t Tim Wu, uh, in terms of your opponent, uh, right. what would you uh, delineate? Kathy Hockel is actually a uh, most known for her opposition when she was a congressperson to uh, to driver's licenses for uh, 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 for undocumented immigrants, and has a pretty conservative uh, record in Congress. Yet. Uh, uh, Governor Cuomo has chosen her this time around as his running mate. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, G Governor Cuomo had a, a wide <laughs> range of choices for uh, who he could have chose to be his running mate, the uh, lieutenant governor candidate. And um, somehow he found a bank lobbyist <laughs> for the job, uh, maybe on the idea that banks are underrepresented in the state capital, which I don't <laughs> think is, is true. He found a bank lobbyist with one of the most conservative voting records that a Democrat has had in Congress. She voted to drill the Arctic Refuge, wildlife refuge. She voted multiple times to repeal parts of, uh, of, uh, of, Florida, of Obamacare. She uh, voted uh, multiple times to gut the Clean Air Act. She has done things which, in my mind, are disqual— you know, I, I believe Democrats can have differences of opinion, but she has gone against the main tenets of the Democratic Party. She even joined. Uh, there was this dramatic incident where the House Republicans were on one of these witch hunts, where they were, uh, uh, you may know, the Fast and Furious, citing Eric Holder for criminal contempt. The House Democrats got up and left the House, physically left the House for that vote. Uh, Kathy Hochul, uh, Cuomo's choice for lieutenant governor, stayed with Speaker Boehner, who voted to hold the, for the first time in history the attorney general, Eric Holder, for, uh, uh, cite him for criminal contempt. And so she has shown over and over again that she is far too conservative and, I think, disqualifying for this state, this Democratic Party. But yet, uh, yes, it was just yesterday that the progressive new mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, and right. the and the founder, co-founder of the Progressive Caucus, Speaker Melissa Marquis Verito, all lined up to support her. Yeah. Uh, the, with respect, Mayor de Blasio, we, we agree almost on— uh, in fact, uh, de Blasio and I agree on almost Almost everything. Today in Political Magazine, we were named together as the new, new left, along with Zephyr Teachout. And then yesterday he made this tremendous error, this mistake of, of, in, of endorsing uh, Kathy Hochul. I think they, they don't agree on any issues. Um, and it was, uh, to my mind, uh, she has been trying to misrepresent herself as a progressive Democrat now. I think he's uh, become an accomplice to her misrepresentation. I think he's made a terrible mistake and he'll regret it. Mm. Well, I wish uh, they were there to here to represent themselves. Uh, Andrew Cuomo and Kathy Hochul were invited to be a part of this debate. And I want to thank you all for being with us. Zephyr Teachout, candidate for New York governor on the Democratic ballot. Tim Wu is her running mate for lieutenant governor. Randy Credico is also a candidate for New York governor on the Democratic ballot. And the election, the primary, is Tuesday. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermi. I mean, Sheikh Steve Martinez, Sam Alkoff, Hani Masood, Robbie Karen, Dina Gesder, Amy Littlefield, Daniel Begun, Anna Ozbeck, Messiah Road, and Sam Riddell. Mike DeFilippo and Miguel Nagara are engineers. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Jessica Lee, John Wallach, and Vesta Godars, and John Randolph, Kieran Craig Meadows, Carlo De Jesus. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.